There are only two genders, male and female, right? Well, no, I mean, not today, right? But traditionally, I mean, right? At least in the West, right? Well, actually, no, not entirely. Third gender traditions, neither male nor female, but a third category, are fairly common across the world, known among Asian, African, Pacific, and American Indian cultures. And in fact, the West is really the odd one out, knowing only two genders until quite recently, but actually that's not true. Did you know that even Europe had its own such tradition, at least one tradition, which arose, flourished, and then disappeared over the span of a few centuries? It occurred in the Roman Empire, especially in the eastern half, which survived much longer and came to be known to historians as the Byzantine Empire, and there it came to be recognized that there was more than just male and female, but a third alternative, and for them, this gender was called a eunuch. Now, third gender traditions are often quite unique in their local manifestations, and this one is no different, being centered on assigned sex males who were, for whatever reason, incapable of reproduction. Contrary to popular belief, you didn't actually have to be castrated to be considered a eunuch in Byzantine eyes. Castration was the most common way that you became a eunuch, but you could also have been born naturally sterile, for example. And these non-reproductive persons came to be understood as neither male nor female, but a third gender category. Historically, they began as exotic imports from abroad, but quickly became a very local tradition, both feared and respected, reviled and adored, devilish and angelic. It's a complicated and fascinating story that's been almost entirely forgotten in European history. So what was it like for this third gender? What was it like for eunuchs? in the Byzantine Empire. How did this third gender tradition arise, and how did it disappear? That's what we're talking about in today's Showcase episode. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the History of Sex. <laughs> History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Hiya, folks. Today we've got a showcase episode coming at you from my other show, Dead Ideas. And on that show, we did have a whole five-part series on Byzantine court eunuchs. So if what you hear today perks your interest, you can check out the rest of the series on Dead Ideas. Meanwhile... I'm hard at work on the next episode of our current series, Sex on the Great Plains. It wasn't quite ready this month, hence this showcase episode to fill in today, but we should be back to the Lakota next month, and that episode will feature a third gender tradition as well, namely the Lakota Winkte, which is of course very different from the Byzantine eunuch, but I thought it might be interesting to have the one next to the other as we consider third gender traditions in different cultures. Also, I do have a kind of big announcement today, and that is that next month's episode will be the final episode of this show. I know I've kind of said that before, but the time has finally come. It'll make 70 episodes of the history of sex, which is way, way more than I ever thought that we would actually manage to complete, so that feels good. That's an achievement. And my creative energies, well... They're just kind of restless, to be honest. I'm ready for something new. I'm not sure what that new thing will be yet. Probably not a podcast, because I'm kind of sick of the deadlines and having trouble making them, as you can see today. Uh, but what will that next thing be? Who knows? I don't know yet. Uh, my creative energies tend to surprise me. So we'll see what happens. It's always an adventure, and I'm looking forward to whatever is next on the horizon. So with that bittersweet announcement out of the way, let's get to the show. Today, we are talking about the Byzantine third gender tradition 
of the eunuch. What did it mean to be a eunuch? What was it like for them? And how did they arise, soar meteorically to fill some of the highest positions in the empire, and then disappear almost entirely from European history? Let's find out. Oh, and by the way, just in case you haven't heard one of these Dead Ideas episodes before, we do have a little bit of a looser feel to them, and I had to bleep out a bunch of uh, words that we used, so um, nothing bad, but it's just not the vibe that we have on this show or the promise that I made to the audience here. So that's just a fair warning for you, but we have a lot of fun on this episode, so here you go. Let's talk Unix. <laughs> Hey everybody, thanks for listening. The music we just heard was composed by Rachel Westhoff, my lovely wife, who took me to the doctor this morning, and the doctor said, <clears throat> looks like you've got a hernia. Well, drop your shorts, and he started sharpening his scalpel. And believe it or not, that was one way that a person back in the day could become a eunuch. What? Hernias? Yes. Hernias. Yes. Believe it or not, castration was a medical treatment for hernias all the way up until the 18th century. Does it work? No. <laughs> <laughs> this one weird trick to reduce hernias. <laughs> yes, uh, there were much more common ways to become a eunuch, as we will soon see. But man, I mean, just I mean, to think of it, you know, and also I really do have a hernia in my back, not in my balls. But <laughs> I, <laughs> if I had lived 200 years earlier, I could have been castrated. Hernia neutered like dick. a dog. <laughs> so the second we didn't take care of that? Uh, no, I don't think it's covered by my insurance either. Ah. Um, anyway, with me today are my co-hosts for this series, Anna. My Put dad's you... got a double hernia. What are they going to do for him? I had a Byzantine obsession. So yeah, oh my sad. god. And Nick? I don't have any Byzantine eunuch insurance, so I think I'm just going to have to keep on like lifting bases with bad technique at work so I can get a hernia to get castrated to get ahead. I still got time to conquer Italy by the time I'm like 50, right? Well, you know, there, there's it's not a glass ceiling exactly, but... <laughs> so, thank you for being on the show, guys. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be a mid-length series, maybe four or five episodes, and today we are going to introduce the idea, and then Anna, next time, is going to take point on an episode or two to bring this dead idea to life with an in-depth look at the right-hand man of, and it looks like I typed in huh. Byzantine, <laughs> Byzantine, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian, uh, who was the court eunuch of Justinian named Narcisse. Mm -hmm. So that will be Anna's baby. Then after that, we're going to have an episode on the sex lives of eunuchs, because believe it or not, yes, eunuchs could have sex. That blew me away. And finally, to finish out this series, we're going to have an interview with renowned podcaster Robin Pearson of the History of Byzantium series, mm -hmm. who's going to talk to us about the connection between eunuchs and the Varangian Guard. Really? Oh. Yes, the Viking bodyguards of the Byzantine Emperor. Interesting. Comparisons of why each of them were employed and what they have in common in that respect. I'm looking forward to that. Hmm. Yes. So it's going to be epic. All right. So the time and place that we're focusing on is the Byzantine Empire, which is what remained of the Roman Empire after the Western half fell apart. It was centered in the east with its capital at Byzantium, which is renamed Constantinople. Byzantium, which is renamed Constantinople. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which was later renamed Istanbul. So I think they might be giants, right? <laughs> Do you oh, know that yeah. song? Yeah. It's Constantinople. It's Istanbul. No, it's Istanbul. It's, anyway. <laughs> Istanbul's? <laughs> uh, sorry. They spoke Greek, as was always customary in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, and the Byzantines, though, called themselves Romans, not Byzantines and not Greeks. They thought of themselves as Romans. They were the inheritors and the continuers of the Roman Empire. They were Romans. Greek-speaking yeah. Romans. Yes. Byzantine is just a convenience that historians have invented so that we could talk about this specific period of the Roman Empire, but they thought of themselves as Romans. So much so that, in fact, in the 19th century... After Greece became like its own country and everything, they went to an island in the Aegean and these little kids came out and they were gawking at the soldiers and the Greek soldiers 
were like, what are you looking at? And the kids were like, we want to see what Greeks look like. And the soldiers said, but aren't you Greek? And they said, no, we're Romans. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real story. So, yeah, the, their identity is bound up and tied with continuing the Roman Empire. So is this why uh, the phrase Byzantine has come to mean unnecessarily convoluted? Yeah. <laughs> it gets more funny yet once the Turks invade, take most of their possessions in Anatolia, and start calling themselves Romans. The Turks called themselves Romans? The Sultanate of Rome. Oh my god, I didn't know that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, You know the famous Sufi poet Rumi? Popular New Age circles? That's where it's from? He's the Roman. That's what oh it means. Oh my god, I did not know that. <laughs> okay, that's why I have you on the show, Nick. <laughs> Anyway, the period that we are talking about, we now call it the Byzantine period, and that would be from 324 CE all the way to 1453 CE. Our topic for today is court eunuchs. Now, let's define that. So, first of all, what is a eunuch? The short version is a man who has been castrated, and that's usually what it meant in Byzantine culture. But, in fact, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. Byzantine eunuchs actually included more than just those who had their balls cut out. It also included any man who could not reproduce. Hmm. Yeah, so that included those who were born naturally sterile, who were born with atypically formed genitalia, and those people would then be called natural eunuchs. It also included anybody who just had their vas deferens damaged, they would also be considered eunuchs. And in fact, that makes technically me a eunuch because Rachel and I right. decided not to have kids and I got the snip snip. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> this makes me a eunuch in Byzantine culture. So this whole series is going to be almost as personal as the Titoism one then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, by way of definitions, a non-eunuch can be referred to as a whole man, or what I actually saw most in actual Byzantine literature was they would refer to them as bearded men, even if you didn't have a beard. But I got the impression that it was kind of like you would want to have a beard so you didn't look like a eunuch. Maybe not a big old Viking beard or a hipster beard, but like you'd have a little bit of like mustache or like shadow or something right. to make it clear that you're a real man, quote unquote. Well, your body's producing testosterone anyway. Right. So anyway, that's what a eunuch is. Now, what is a court eunuch? So a court eunuch is such a man who is employed in the court of the rich and powerful, usually an emperor. In Byzantine culture, this practice was developed to such an extent that other peoples around them actually considered it a distinguishing trait of the Byzantines. They thought of the Byzantines as that people with eunuchs. <laughs> that was like their thing in the medieval world. So did this include like other Islamic cultures or sort of Persian influenced ones to the east? That would yes, but uh, so they also had eunuchs. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering about. Right. But for some reason it was attached to Byzantine culture in particular, maybe because they had more contact because they were Christian. Right. But it yeah. wasn't a thing like Persians would think of the Byzantines as those weird people with eunuchs. Cause they oh, that part too. I don't know. Yeah, I just okay. don't have any information on sure. what they thought. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. So, so the emperor would surround himself with eunuchs, even literally in certain ceremonies, to the point where you couldn't see the emperor because he was encircled by eunuchs. It was almost like putting up a veil to increase the mystery. And there developed this whole aura around eunuchs, associated with imperial authority and power, with sex and licentiousness, Woo! and at the very same time with celibacy in angelic holiness, in that weird paradoxical kind of way that tends to happen in culture. So it's sort of like a widow. Yeah, definitely with the, the female widows. I yeah. see the parallels. DTF, yeah. yeah. So DTF. wait, yeah, down the f***. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> right. Mm. So it's basically the virgin whore dichotomy for man? Yeah, it's yep. all right. Much. Finally! Yes, it is. Finally. <laughs> yes, eunuchs are that. So they had all that going on, and in fact, eunuchs became so prevalent in Byzantine culture that, in the opinion of scholar Catherine Ringrose, they even came to constitute a third gender in Byzantine culture. Hmm. Yes, we'll get into that. But speaking of gender, there's going to be a lot of talk today about gender and identity, which is obviously a hot topic these days, from transgender rights to, you know, People like Caitlyn Jenner. There's just a lot going on. And even, did you guys know in Game of Thrones, there's actually a eunuch character? Yeah. Yeah, eunuchs. there's actually more than one. Yeah. Huh. So. 
Also, there are in fact people today who identify as eunuchs. So this topic is timely, and also we understand that there may be listeners out there feeling the struggle of working out gender identities that don't fit the traditional mold. That's a thing. All we can say is, yeah, it's going to be messy this series, and you know maybe something in the series will strike a chord with people. Anyway, the least we can say is Byzantine gender categories were quite different from ours, and it will be interesting. So there we go. Okay, so let's get into it. So I want to start with a scene from an actual Byzantine text. Mm. This comes from a text by Theophanes the Confessor, and it introduces the weird power dynamic surrounding eunuchs in the Byzantine world. And by the way, unfortunately, we have no texts from eunuchs themselves. So everything we hear in this series is going to be mediated through the voices of whole men. That's just an unfortunate fact of what we're dealing with here. Is the reason why there aren't any eunuch voices that... They're high-pitched. <laughs> is most of the literature clerical at this time, and you couldn't be like a priest or a monk as a eunuch? That is not the reason, because there were many monk and priest eunuchs. Okay, that's it. Yeah, so a lot of the literature is clerical. And although the church had a very ambiguous position on eunuchs, some of them were, in fact, monks or priests, which makes it all the more surprising that we just didn't get anything so from them because they're highly literate in both Yeah, that's what I thought. Roles. It's like... It's like, what the hell? They're all people in the diplomatic yeah. corps probably writing all the time. Was their so... writing expunged? I didn't get any references yeah. to that. There's nothing that I read about lost eunuch writings. So I don't know. It's just very surprising to hmm. me. So... Here's the setup for this snippet from this Byzantine text. It's the mid-7th century CE, and there's a rebellion going on in the Byzantine Empire. Woo! Both the rebels and the emperor are in this scene trying to enlist the aid of the Umayyad Arab Caliph, whose name is Muawiyah. Mm -hmm. The Umayyads are like a neighboring power, Muslims. The rebels send a general named Sergios, and the emperor sends his chamberlain, Andrew, who is, of course, a eunuch. Okay? All right, so to quote the text, When Andrew had reached Damascus, he found that Sergius had anticipated him. As for Mauius, that's how it's written here. Huh. Mauius is yeah. the Arab way. As for Mauius, he pretended to be sympathetic to the emperor. Sergius was sitting in front of Mauius, and when Andrew entered, Sergius, on seeing him, got up. Mauius upbraided Sergius, saying, Why were you afraid? And Sergius excused himself, saying he had done so out of habit. So in other words, the eunuch walks in, and the rebel Byzantine guy, just like absentmindedly out of habit, just like stands up mm -hmm. out of respect. So that shows you something right there, mm -hmm. right? And then the Arab is like, What the f*** are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> it's like... And then the guy, he's like, oh, yeah, oops, and he sits down. <laughs> I forgot, I'm a rebel now. Yeah, that, that, that's not my... <laughs> yeah, so right off the bat, we see the awkward tensions that are very revealing for the culture. Now, the Arabs also employed eunuchs, as we mentioned just a moment before. But the culture for them around eunuchs was quite different. Arab eunuchs were mostly foreign slaves usually but not always black Africans, employed mainly to look after the harems. In some cases, later on, they got an association with guarding holy tombs, like the tomb of Muhammad too. Mm -hmm. In contrast, though, the Byzantines by the 7th century were employing eunuchs both foreign-born and native, mm -hmm. slave and non-slave, and for all kinds of courtly duties and diplomatic missions, and their status and imperial aura was so pervasive at that point in the culture that this Sergius guy just completely forgets himself and it's right. like, oh, just jumps to his feet as if the president had walked in. Or know. a really weird episode of Downton Abbey. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But that's not where it ends, because although eunuchs served as extensions of the emperor's power, they were not the emperor, and many were jealous and resentful of the favor that they enjoyed with the emperor. So here's what happens next in the snippet. The next day, Sergius anticipated Andrew and was seated in front of Mauius. When Andrew entered, he did not arise as on the previous day, 
Looking around at Sergius, Andrew cursed him mightily and threatened him, saying, If I remain alive, I will show you who I am. And Sergius replied, I'm not getting up for you, because you are neither a man nor a woman. After that, negotiations with the Arab caliph fall apart. But the eunuch Andrew does get his revenge uh, for this insult. He lays an ambush for the rebel Sergius at a place called Amnesia. That's what it was really called. You're hmm? kidding. <laughs> it was really called Amnesia. Yes, it was the name of the town. What was Any... it called? I forget. I forget. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, he lays an ambush for the rebel Sergius at this place, and he captures him. And then Sergius falls to his knees and begs Andrew to spare his life. But here's what Andrew says. Are you the Sergius who took pride in his private parts in front of Mauius and called me effeminate? Behold, from now on your private parts will be of no benefit to you. Nay, they will cause your death. And then he has his men cut Sergius's balls off and hang him from a gibbet. And so that's why you didn't want to mess with eunuchs. Yeah. <laughs> I was figuring they're going to be stuffed in his mouth at the end of that picture, but maybe I just have to... Only on Game of Thrones. This. Okay. That was a little Game of Thronesy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that gives an idea of, like, the fuller picture of the tensions surrounding eunuchs. They were high and mighty because they were imbued with this imperial authority and power, but they were also highly resented because of that influence and power and also because of... That kind of weird way that people who occupy a liminal position in a culture mm -hmm. tend to be kind of like outsider, what do I want to call it, um, othered. Mm -hmm. Yes, people become othered and then resented for that reason. So there's something going on that we can easily identify with today. I mean, it's not exactly homophobia because it's not about sexual preference, but it's something like it. So you could, you know, coin a word like eunuchophobia or mm -hmm. something like that. Despite their power and status in Byzantine culture, eunuchs clearly still had plenty to overcome. Yeah. So we learn a number of interesting things from this scene. First of all, we learn that court eunuchs in the 7th century were extensions of imperial power, as I said. Andrew is specifically the emperor's chamberlain, or guardian of the bedchamber, mm -hmm. one of the most important and influential roles in the Byzantine Empire. Right. Finally, we also see personality traits displayed by Andrew, which are seen as part of a eunuch gender stereotype. Revenge! <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily revenge, but what underlies revenge, maybe. Mutilation so, and revenge. <laughs> <laughs> so in contrast to bearded men, who were supposed to be disciplined and in control of their emotions, eunuchs were stereotyped as lacking that disciplined quality. Hmm. That made them emotional, easily upset, lording their authority over others in a petty kind of way. So Andrew in this scene flies off the handle with a single insult, and it's like, oh yeah, I'll show you. And that's part of uh, the stereotype that the Byzantines had of the eunuch gender. So natural diplomats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does raise some questions <sighs> about their appropriateness. So this does raise another interesting question, though, which was, what was that stereotype of the eunuch? Like, what's the fuller picture there? Mm -hmm. This gets us into the whole idea of Byzantine gender constructs generally. And this is something that I found really fascinating. So, like, you know, how does another culture construct gender? So, in contrast to our society, Byzantine gender was centered more on physical makeup, mannerisms, and dress. So a lot of outside kind of things, whereas we would maybe focus on behavior or insides. It didn't matter so much who you had sex with. That really wasn't the thing that gendered you. But rather what your body was like physically and how you presented yourself to society was what gendered you. It was performative. It was performative, exactly. Yes. If you had sex with other men, it might have been considered a reprehensible act by some, particularly some church fathers, but it didn't necessarily make you this or that gender. Rather, gender was about what was going on with your body and your behavior, so it was part what you could call anatomy and part what you could call like something like subculture, like how you behave, right? So I want to talk about those two things. What was 
the eunuch anatomy like and what was their subculture like? And so I'll start with the anatomy part. So to be a eunuch, you had to be born male. Well, mostly. Just assigned or, male at birth. Yeah. Assigned male at birth is a good way to put it, because as we heard with the natural eunuchs part, you could be what today we would call intersex, right? Or ambiguous genitalia. They would probably call that a eunuch. So either that or assigned male at birth, right? Then you had to be either non-reproductive from birth, as in the natural eunuch, or you had to be made non-reproductive by accident or by intention. So accidents could happen in the case of uh, General Solomon, who was one of Justinian's generals, I believe, whose balls were crushed in infancy by a nurse who swaddled them too tightly by oh, accident. God. Yeah. And also there was another guy, I forget his name, but he got stepped on by a horse. So those things happened, ah. you know. <laughs> but mostly eunuchs were made intentionally. It might have been as punishment for a crime, it could have been as preparation for the slave market. It could have been a medical treatment, as we heard with the hernia thing. Or it could have been a half-cocked family scheme to get one of your sons into the imperial bureaucracy so they could make a bunch of money and send it back home to the family. Mm -hmm. That happened. John the Orphanotrophus. <laughs> it may even have been your extreme ill fortune to have born into the imperial family itself. If you oh, happen yeah. to have a paranoid emperor who wants to eliminate potential rivals for the throne. Mm -hmm. That happened, as in the case of Emperor Michael V, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had his whole, all the males in his family castrated, as I understand. Mm -hmm. And it was seen as being more merciful than executing them, or just, you know, so, murdering them outright. But Hold to the audience. Yeah. If you had to choose between a vengeful emperor castrating you or cutting off your nose. Uh Send in and vote. Hidden or exposed, right? Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, of course, that didn't stop Emperor Justinian II, who that happened to. He just stormed back, got a rip-roaring thing of revenge, and then got deposed in the second time. And this time they killed him. Justinian II lost his nose? Yeah, or his, okay. he lost his nose. They mutilated him because there was a whole thing in the Byzantine, I'm sure you're going to touch on, about mutilation and about how rulers were considered to have to have... Be whole men, not just with their genitals, but every other sticking out part. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was just going to yeah. mention, which the whole reason why you would castrate potential rivals, because you had to be a whole man to mm -hmm. be an emperor. Okay. So anyway, there were all kinds of ways to end up as a eunuch, but by far the most common way was intentional manufacture for the Byzantine slave market. And the most common place that eunuchs in Constantinople came from was a place called Abgazia, on the northeast Black Sea, which is modern-day Georgia, which was known for the comeliness of its boys, and the king there made a pretty penny on the sale. So. It also might or might not have been a land of perpetual darkness, depending on which medieval traveler's tales you read. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Comes up in an Umberto Eco novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those made intentionally were subjected to a medical procedure, obviously, of which there were two kinds. And we actually have the writings of a 7th century doctor named Paul of Aegina, who says that he didn't like to perform the operations, but sometimes the rich and powerful pressured him to do it. And then he recorded the two ways to do it. So he says... So much for Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> <laughs> he says that one way to do it, this would be for a very young child, uh, is to soak the young boy in a hot bath till its uh, genitalia were softened ah. and then crush the nuts between your fingers. Ah. Yes. This is not the preferable way because sometimes they're not completely crushed and some sexual desire remains afterward. Well, so wouldn't that be like infections and a bunch of... I'm sure there was all excruciatingly painful, on. even in a prepubescent boy. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not... I'm obviously, I've never had to contend with these interesting developments, but if they're not really descended yet, can you really damage them that badly? Yes. Yeah. Apparently yeah. you can. Yeah. Like Solomon. Okay. Yeah. The other way, which is more preferable, is to make a surgical incision in the sack and then take the testicles out. And that you could do potentially at any age. The penis was usually left intact in the Byzantine way, which is in contrast to China, where they took both the franc and the beans. In Byzantium, they generally just took the beans. In any case, once the male junk is rendered non-reproductive, you're no longer considered male at that point you are 
a different gender. Now, what's going on with said junk can also affect the secondary sex characteristics sure. going on in the rest of your body. So it's still the anatomy part here. If you are castrated before puberty, your body tends to develop differently. Eunuchs were described as beardless, long-limbed, feminine-shaped, high-voiced, with infantile genitalia, and very wrinkly skin once you get older. Like, you wrinkle faster. Mm -hmm. However, if you are castrated after puberty... That means that all of those secondary sex characteristics had time to mature while you had the testosterone flowing through your body and stuff. So you wouldn't have these signs. You would look pretty much like a typical male, right? Mm -hmm. So not all eunuchs displayed these characteristics. And presumably and, the same if you're just born sterile. You wouldn't have... Yeah, exactly. Right. So it was actually a dividing line in Byzantine society among eunuchs. And eunuch, eunuchs who were made before puberty were typically honored and seen as preserving something pure, but those made after puberty were typically looked down upon and seen as enabling you to enjoy the pleasures of sex without any of the consequences because you're not going to be able to make anybody pregnant. Right. So. Interesting. Yeah. So all of that is the anatomy part. Now we come to, you know, the culture, behavior, that kind of part, right? The subculture. So eunuchs in Byzantine culture had a distinctive set of mannerisms and dress. It is said that they walked with a gait like a woman. They were slack and loose-limbed. They held their hands away from their body with palms lifted. The continual what? <laughs> the continual what? <laughs> they spoke with rapid and rhythmic words. They never looked you in the eye, instead looking down their nose at you with eyebrows lifted. <laughs> they laughed inappropriately, talked too much, cried easily, abused food and drink, and had an acquisitive streak about them. And if you presented yourself this way in Byzantine society, you were not male. You were a different gender. You were a eunuch. Those are the two ways that you were put in this other box. Right. So Put it's on. very behavioral, basically. It's very behavioral. It's both the anatomy and the behavior. And there's a fuzzy line about what if you had the anatomy but not the behavior. But, you know, that things are always messy in cultures, yeah. right? So we can also talk about clothing. I don't know about all eunuchs, but if you were a court eunuch in particular, you tended to wear white robes with distinctive jewelry, particularly large pearls, hmm. which is normally reserved for the royal family only but eunuchs were allowed to wear large pearls. That kind of was another out, outward sign of your gender. All of that comprises the eunuch identity, which, according to Catherine Ringrose, constituted a third gender in Byzantine culture. And it does provide a fairly rich picture of, you know, what eunuchs were like. And it's also not completely negative, either. There are two positive traits of eunuchs, that uh, came out in Byzantine culture. We haven't mentioned them yet, so I'll do it now. First of all, they were considered well-minded, meaning that they possessed an intelligence and a freedom of thought that they thought was not typical of other kinds of slaves. They thought that slaves in general were kind of just stupid and menial, but eunuchs were better at, you know, intelligent tasks that you gave them. Hmm. They also considered them to be perfect servants, at least according to Ring Rose. They were ideally suited for taking orders and carrying them out. And it's that last one that interests me the most, because here's the thing. I can understand other cultures constructing gender differently. That We see that everywhere, right? All kinds of... It's, it's a cultural thing, how you construct gender, so obviously you would see differences, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Why would what's going on with your junk be a qualifying characteristic for serving in court, <laughs> right? What does the one have to do with the other? Well, I can think just right off the top of my head, I mean, apart from, you know, gender identity, which is not related necessarily to junk, one of the primary things is that you wouldn't, if you were a ruler and you were trying to ensure a dynasty, mm -hmm. you don't want somebody who might interface with, say, your empress Mm -hmm. In a way where your issue is suddenly not necessarily guaranteed to be yours. That is I mean, a good point yeah, that we will get into. Guard. I mean, yeah, there's the, the whole, stereotype. Yeah, well, it's a stereotype, but 
I mean, there's the later in Byzantine history, I can think of at least one example. Basil the first of the founder of the Macedonian dynasty mm -hmm. uh, inherits basically uh, while he's still serving the emperor. He inherits the, one of the emperor's favorite girlfriends, so and has to marry her so that said girlfriend can stay at court and you know behind the <laughs> scenes. But it's speculated that his first son, with air quotes, was actually that emperor's illegitimate son, which was oh, probably one of the reasons why he okay. hated him. Okay. So, and that was a whole wrinkle because if that's true, the Macedonian dynasty isn't descended from Basil; it's descended from the previous emperor. Yeah. And so that's yeah. a that's a whole ball of worms. Mm -hmm. That's also a really good transition to what I wanted to talk about next, which are all of the reasons, such as that, why eunuchs somehow ended up in court, right, in the court of emperors. So, and that's that's exactly where we're going with it. So, let's talk about that now. So many different cultures throughout history have employed eunuchs at court, not just the Byzantines. They go back as far as ancient Egypt. We think they had them. They also probably had them in Assyria. Persia had them. Even Norman Sicily had them. The Muslim caliphates in the Ottoman Empire were famous for them, and so was Imperial China, who actually kept court eunuchs all the way up until the 19th century. There's something about these strong, centralized autocratic empires that seem to find eunuchs like useful or attractive in some way as servants and court staff. And it's like, why? Right? So what I want to do now is go through late Roman and Byzantine history and trace the development of eunuchs in that specific culture. And along the way, we're going to get a clearer picture of why they ended up surrounding the emperor like angels around God. And I'm going to be following mainly historian Sean Tuffer for much of this part. So, to start with, Roman culture before the Byzantine period did not look favorably upon eunuchs at all. Eunuchs were known from foreign peoples, and also they were known within the empire from radical cultists, particularly the priesthood of the mother goddess Kibbele, mm -hmm. whose priests would whip themselves into a frenzy and then castrate themselves in imitation of the goddess's consort, Attis. And this cult came, supposedly at least, from Phrygia and was officially adopted into the Roman Empire in 218 BCE at the advice of oracles, but it never really quite felt Roman. It always felt like those people, kind of like how Hari Krishnas might feel in Western culture today, that they, just, they always seem other, you know what I mean? So eunuchs were weird. They were not just weird, though, from the Roman perspective, but actually, in the Roman eyes, an offense against nature. With a culture as patrician as the Romans were, family lineage was everything, and cutting off the ability to carry on the family line was a downright insult to you know their whole way of life. It was strictly illegal for Romans to be castrated other than for medical reasons. So if you were going to have eunuchs, they had to be foreign-born. However, that did not stop the Romans at all from importing said foreign-born eunuchs as slaves. To lift their heavy objects so that they wouldn't get hernias and have to become eunuchs themselves. <laughs> uh, that's a good connection. So why would, why would they do that other than <laughs> to have them <laughs> lift heavy objects? Um, well, see, here's the thing. Eunuchs, being so foreign to Roman culture, were exotic. And so, they were special. And they were expensive. And so, they were luxury goods. Mm. And so, they came to be seen in this way as status symbols. So, buying a foreign eunuch slave was conspicuous consumption. It's like having a Japanese vase if you're Victorian. or Yeah, it's a lot like that. You showed off your wealth... By being like, have you met my foreign eunuch slave? You know, just like, have you seen my Japanese vase? It's, yeah, there was a status symbol. Please don't knock over my slave. I put it on a poster. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, or, or I think of like an American being like, would you like a Cuban cigar? Yeah. Because, you know, it's like a status symbol that you can get Cubans during the embargo, you know? Secondly, the other reason was what you were saying. They were thought to be safe to have in the household around your women folk. 
They were seen as lacking sexual desire, which was usually true, at least of those who were castrated before puberty. I was going to ask if that was sort of a line. Mostly. Yeah. It wasn't always true. Even if you were castrated before puberty, sometimes some sexual desire remained. But for the most part. But at minimum, anyway, even if you did have sexual desire, at least you couldn't knock her off. Right? You couldn't reproduce. So in that sense, you were safe. And so basically... Even if, you know, you were relatively okay with in private, knowing that somebody might be, you know, doing the dirty with your woman, the public wouldn't find out because she wouldn't get big with child, you know what I mean? You wouldn't be a publicly a cuckold. And that was very important. Face was very important to the culture. So eventually it became a mark of status for any wealthy family to have a eunuch slave as your chamberlain, your guardian of the bedchamber, specifically. In fact, it became so prevalent that if you were a chamberlain and you were not a eunuch, people just kind of assumed that there was something a little fruity about you. Finally, there was the idea that eunuchs were more loyal because they were outsiders. The fact that eunuchs were foreigners and generally kind of disgusting to Romans meant that they were socially isolated. Is this the Vrangian guard hook later on, partly? It may be. They were socially isolated because they had no one else to depend on except their master. It was like, sure, you can betray me, or you could run away, but good luck trying to survive out there in the real world as a eunuch. So you're probably going to stick in my, you know, household. So they were seen as more trustworthy for that reason. So that was how the eunuch thing got started in the early to middle Roman period, in a culture that found eunuchs weird and foreign and kind of gross and an insult to nature. It got planted that way. They were almost all foreign slaves, although you might be a freed slave. That was fairly common for Romans to free their slaves. So you might have, you might achieve independence, but you usually started out as a slave. And it was usually about status display and conspicuous consumption that brought you into the empire. Now, a weird stroke of luck befell the eunuch when the Roman Republic became an empire. Before, politics in the Roman Republic was all about public display in the Senate of the many different patrician families and kind of like having influence with the public. But as executive power became gathered around one person, the emperor, when it changed to an empire, Suddenly, it became enormously important to have as much face time as possible with that one person, the emperor. And who has more face time with the emperor than his own household staff, which by this point is typically full of eunuchs? Mm -hmm. So the late Roman period saw eunuchs rise from just household slaves to household slaves with benefits. Or freed slaves, but basically you get the idea. Now, as we move into the Byzantine period... As the emperor begins to withdraw from public life more and more and become kind of a secluded figure operating from his own household, his eunuch staff becomes even more important. Now, not only do they get the most face time of anybody, but they also get to control who gets in or out of the household to see the emperor. So they become the gatekeepers of politics. So eventually, there are some of the highest status officers in the entire empire. They get filthy rich, taking bribes from people who want to see the emperor. And they acquire such an authority and aura of power that they begin to be seen as extensions of the emperor himself. So that is the trajectory of the meteoric rise of eunuchs from weird slaves, foreign-born, to the most, some of the most influential people in the Byzantine Empire. So is it also the case to an extent, did this come up in your research at all, that it was just sort of more socially acceptable in Greece, being closer to it being kind of an Eastern Mediterranean thing from way back. No. That Romans or Italians thought was weird, that once sort of the focus of power moved to... Yeah, no, not really. Um, I think maybe in more of the Mediterranean areas, like uh, along the kind of Palestinian coast, perhaps, you know, or being closer to Persian influence, perhaps, but not Greeks so much. What really did it was the fact that they were achieving such influential positions. And that seemed to be what raised their raised their perceptions in society from 
almost entirely negative to on balance positive. They never completely overcame a lot of the negative stereotypes, but they became highly positive at a certain point. I mean, they were they were just so influential, they were so high and mighty. Eventually it came to the point where Byzantine families were actually taking their own sons and castrating them in the hopes of they would, you know, one day make it into the bureaucracy or something and make lots of money and send money back home. An heir, a spare, an accountant. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you get exactly. So you get to the point where now you've got both native and non-native eunuchs. You've got both uh, slave and freeborn eunuchs. And and they're also all over Byzantine society, not just in the court, but you can pretty much find them everywhere. You you see them like as thespians. You see them as prostitutes. You see them as just the guy down the street who's selling loaves of bread because uh, he didn't make it into the bureaucracy. He failed his bar exam or something. Yeah, that's what I was just and, wondering. Like, yeah, I mean... What they, happens to the ones that don't make it? Were there certain social niches that were usual or... Yeah, I mean... Typically, they were court eunuchs or prostitutes, but they ended up everywhere because there was just that many of them being produced. There was yeah. a glut. There was a glut of eunuchs in the also, Byzantine Empire. in that society, thespian and prostitute not being Very, terribly yes. Well, no, the co- according category. to They were actually seen as the yeah. same, actually, believe it or not. So just focus in specifically now on the court eunuchs themselves. Eunuchs filled all kinds of roles, and they were highly ranked in order of status. At the bottom of the status hierarchy for eunuchs were the wash basin holders. And then after that came the chamberlains, which we have heard plenty about already. Then the armed chamberlains, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who were basically bodyguards of the emperor. Then there were the doorkeepers. Then there were the primakarios, or first eunuch, within a given category of eunuchs. So like a boss of, you know, Boss of the Chamberlains, the boss head of the basin West, carrier. <laughs> head basin carrier. You've got to graduate to these lesser eunuchs before you can take him on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the chief guard, and finally on top was the most illustrious prepositos, or chief of all the household eunuchs. And eunuchs could even rise so high that they could hold the high title of patrician, which in Byzantine culture basically meant noble or aristocrat. Yeah. So each time you defeat one of the boss eunuchs, you get a little screen. Sorry, the emperor is in another castle. Yeah, basically. <laughs> also, you have to be careful with your strategies. They're strangely immune to poison. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> there were also roles legally reserved for eunuchs. The chief eunuch, the eunuch in charge of the imperial wardrobe, the master of the emperor's table, the master of the empress's table, the caretaker of the great palace, the second caretaker of the great palace, the imperial waiter the Empress's Imperial Waiter, and two more kinds of caretakers were all reserved specifically for eunuchs. You had to be a eunuch to serve that role. It would be a really weird, like, ad on Indeed, where it's like, must must have been born anatomically male, but... (laughs) Yes, it's it's a really great resume. You've got a lot of experience. I notice you seem to have your testicles still. (laughs) That's going to be a problem. No, that's okay. I was born sterile. Okay. All right. We're going to need to prove that. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Treasure was another common one. It wasn't reserved for eunuchs, but it was very common for eunuchs, so much so that there was a story I read about a bearded man who was given the office of treasure, and he was like, what the f***? <laughs> so he was pissed off because, like, it made him look, you know, effeminate. Yeah. So oh, I'm sorry, he took your it as high-ranking an insult. job with the imperial <laughs> bureaucracy wasn't everything you wanted. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could go to sell bread. Yeah. So with all of this, eunuchs just... They acquired a basically a near magical aura about them, and this is aptly conveyed by the role that they played in imperial ceremony. Now, you have to remember that in Eastern Orthodox religion, and Nick, you can back me up on this. Tell me if I've got this wrong. Uh, the emperor is not just the secular authority, but also the head of the church. You've kind of got it wrong, but what, let's what's not... the right way? Uh, I don't know what the short right way is, so. Well, my understanding but is... The Western stereotype is that in Eastern Orthodox religion, the emperor is the head of the church. In actual fact, that's Anglicanism, not Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay. But... So can we at minimum say that the emperor plays a very important role in Eastern totally. Orthodoxy? Totally, yes. Okay. A very important and different and sort of 
hierarchical and role that's ritually not... prescribed. Yes. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of ritual associated then with the emperor and things he can do that no one else can in a church service. Yes. Right. He also appoints okay. patriarchs. Right? No, that's yeah. another very contested thing. Mm-hmm. Well, there's also a whole bunch of ritual associated with who is allowed to touch the emperor or take something directly from the emperor's hand because in part it's almost like being so close to god that it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, almost like the emperor could become polluted by profane contact with other people, or you could be, you know, it's almost like get that lightning rod from God by touching the emperor. Yeah. I'll certainly say the things that you said about eunuchs surrounding the emperor and having a veiled cloud, uh-huh. and there's lots of parallels with how Eastern Orthodox liturgy to sort of liturgical worship works. It, it's okay. sounding very familiar and resonant. Okay. So my question then becomes, who becomes the intermediaries for this powerful sacredness that's channeled through the emperor. And the answer to that would be the eunuchs. The eunuchs take on that role in a lot of imperial ceremony. Mm -hmm. For example, Ringrose describes how church candles were lit. Fairly mundane feature, you would think. (laughs) Unless you had Father George as your priest. (laughs) (laughs) So she writes... The most common ceremonial form is illustrated by the almost daily ceremony that involved the lighting of ecclesiastical candles. The chief eunuch took a candle from a supply carried by one of the eunuchs of the cubiculum, Mm -hmm. uh, that's the bedchamber, lit it, and then handed it to the emperor. When the emperor completed the part of the ceremony requiring candles, he handed the candle back to the chief eunuch, who passed it to a lesser eunuch, who then placed it in a ceremonial candle holder. So it's almost like there has to be this like step down, like an electrical transformer kind of thing mm-hmm. to mediate this power. Another thing interesting is the patriarch of the church is one person who might actually receive something directly from the emperor without intermediaries. But otherwise, for any other person, it was something very rare and special. Those granted a very high rank might receive their badge of office directly from the emperor's own hand. And if they did, it was like, holy s***. Right. (laughs) You know, this is direct from the emperor. It really had this numinous quality about it. He hands you something metal and he scuffs on a a woolen carpet without meaning to, and you get a shock in it for a second. You're just like, (laughs) (laughs) You're like, it's real. (laughs) Other things. Eunuchs also spoke for the emperor in many ceremonies. They were the only ones allowed to witness the emperor's crown being put on or taken off. Hmm. You could witness the emperor without his crown, but no one was allowed to see you put it on or take it off, except for eunuchs. When the emperor went about inside the palace, he was typically surrounded by eunuchs. And in one ceremony for being outside the palace, it literally prescribes the emperor being completely enclosed by a circle of eunuchs, like we mentioned before, um, almost like a veil like an enclosure of a shrine, like of the Holy of Holies, mm-hmm. almost. So that is just how high the eunuchs flew in Byzantine culture. From humble origins as foreign slaves, employed literally because everyone despised you, and they could only survive by staying loyal to their master, they reached the highest echelons of political power and influence, and beyond that even into the quasi-spiritual realm, finally acquiring such an aura of purity that they were Practically angels on earth, it seemed like. Other fun fact, even yeah. in traditionalist Catholic liturgy, mm-hmm. if a bishop shows up to your church, there are still people that have to put on and take off his clothes. It's in very specifically prescribed formal ways. That makes sense. And but it doesn't basically have to be has chamberlains. Yeah. Well, they have to be celibate. Okay, well, there's <laughs> so, a connection. Uh, wait, wait, so they, they can't just be deacons doing that? Oh, you're right. They, I think they probably can't just be deacons. I wasn't trying to be... No, I, th- that, I just thought, I remember your mom saying the people doing yeah, that were I, deacons. They probably were deacons. Okay. So interesting quick connection between eunuchs and celibacy and the church. Many in the church, well, some in the church thought eunuchs were great. Others thought they were terrible. And the connection with celibacy for the ones who thought they were terrible, they thought that a eunuch, although celibate, theoretically, it was not the right kind of celibacy. Because you didn't have to work for sure, yourself. Sure, you're not suppressing anything. You're, I mean, not suppre- or... you're not earning it. Yeah. 
You're not it's having the... a victory over the flesh. It's just exactly. pre-existingly one for you. Counterpoint. Exactly. If you castrate yourself, though, is that sort of like in the vein of the if your left hand defends, you cut it off thing? I think you could make a case for that. Oh, there's more specific gospel references than that. They're I think eunuchs I'm... that made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven and eunuchs that exactly. were born that way. And I think I'm immediately going to consider you a heretic. So... Well, just now, <laughs> just now. It's still kind of squibbly whether Origen, who did that literally and cut off his own junk, but was also a terribly important ch- early church father. Exactly. No one seems to even agree whether he was a heretic or not. So, so Origen's is an interesting <laughs> one because yes, he cut off his own junk. He made himself a eunuch, um, and then later he ended up arguing theologically that the whole thing in the Bible about eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven should be taken metaphorically and not literally. (laughs) So it was a little too late. It didn't help my hernia, guys. (laughs) And he occupies a weird and liminal and oddly gendered place in church history. So there you go. So the last thing we have to talk about today, how did this dead idea die? The twilight of the eunuchs. How did these angels fall? So, how did the unit Byzantine eunuchs disappear? That sounded like a tagline for a square soft game. <laughs> <laughs> a what? <laughs> Twilight right. of the eunuchs, how colon. Did, how, how did these <laughs> angels fall? <laughs> See, my whole time, once you one slip of the mouth branded it earlier, I've just been hearing the WWE wrestler, the eunuch from Munich. <laughs> <laughs> eunuch from Munich. All right. Sorry. Nice. Um, <laughs> That's staying in. Okay, so how did the eunuchs disappear, right? So eunuchs started being viewed more positively, as I said, uh, in the Byzantine period. It was about around the 7th century or so. They reached the height of their ascendancy around the 11th century and then began to decline in the 13th century with the last known Byzantine court eunuchs disappearing in the 15th century. The theories for why this decline happened are kind of like all over the place. I'm going to go and say one is the disappearance of the Byzantine Empire. (laughs) That's probably (laughs) one of them. Oh, way too obvious. But other than the Muslims, there weren't many other cultures in that part of the world that carried it on. So it's also like, well, why not? Why didn't the Serbs suddenly start having eunuchs? Or... Right, because yeah, they were they were you know very much adjacent to Byzantine yeah. culture slash part of it, right? So that, there's an argument to yeah. be made, right? Yeah. So we'll go through a couple of the theories, right? One reason may be that the Byzantine capital Constantinople was captured by the Fourth Crusade in the 13th century. Mm-hmm. That seemed like the obvious one to me. Right. So, yeah. first of all, it's like, well, why would Christians go on a crusade and then conquer a Christian of city? This. I have so many feelings about this. So, of course, the, the Catholic Christians consider the Eastern Orthodox to be fair game for a crusade. So. Doge Enrique Dandolo is a f- that's why. But, above and beyond that, why does... The capturing of Constantinople mean eunuchs go down? Well, the thing was the court then had to be moved, and that just disrupted everything. It disrupted the status quo and allowed an opportunity for you know eunuchs to no longer necessarily fill those same roles. Maybe the roles weren't there. Or, yeah, you know, other I mean, people got a foot in. There was an interregnum of a whole generation when they... The when Byzantines they went weren't off to in Trebizond. Constantinople, yeah. yeah, and then yeah, I'm assuming they never really quite recaptured the same. Oh like, no, no, it was swagger. But Constantine the Eleventh, it was like just sort of card tables, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's where the eunuchs were sitting at yes. the card table yes. at that the, family the, gathering. Yeah, it was. It was like <laughs> the, the kitty table. The one who sets up the emperor's um, lunchables, basically. That's what, <laughs> that's about the level of pomp and circumstance they can manage. <laughs> okay. Well, another reason why they went down is the negative view of eunuchs in the West. So, like I said before, the Byzantines became more and more viewed by other Western powers that were gaining more and more influence in the medieval period as the ones who employed eunuchs, and that was weird to them. And the Byzantines, since Western Europe was gaining in power, wanted to be able to interact more and more with them, and it, they kind of became a little bit of a diplomatic liability to have that so prominently in their culture. Another reason uh, that the eunuchs might have gone by the wayside is the nature of imperial rule also started to change. Um, While the imperial administration had long been pretty much meritocratic, you would earn your position mostly by your talents, other than the emperor's position, 
Starting with the 11th century, it changed to be more familial in nature, so that positions came to be held by the emperor's kin rather than by those who were qualified to do the job. And that kicked out a lot of the eunuchs because, you know, they, positions were given to other kinds of people. Maybe. Unless you were relatives were, you did get them to the relatives, but they had you castrated. Right. I mean, <laughs> where the, where, in the Venn diagram where both kin and eunuch overlapped, you would still right. have eunuchs. But for the most part, it was starting to go with your family members mm -hmm. rather than, yeah. And the final reason why they might have uh, disappeared was because of changing perceptions. Eunuchs had been seen as trustworthy for all the reasons that we discussed, but after enough scandals involving eunuchs, people just finally kind of got wise to the game, realized they were people just like anybody else and subject to temptations just like anybody else. And so they lost their holy aura as these trustworthy, loyal servants. Eunuch scandal is going to be a future episode, right? <laughs> I think it's a game show. <laughs> I think that's a well, JRPG dating sim, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Eunuch scandal. <laughs> How did these angels fall? <laughs> so it's not completely clear whether some or all of these reasons are actually responsible, but by the 15th century, we just don't hear about any more Byzantine court eunuchs. Now, outside of Byzantium, court eunuchs continued to be employed for many centuries. The Chinese employed court eunuchs, as we said, all the way up through the 19th century. The famous Admiral Zheng He who is said to have reached the Americas 90 years before Columbus, was, was a eunuch. eunuch. Huh. He was a eunuch. Wasn't he also Muslim? I want to say maybe he was. Okay. Speaking of Muslims, in the Muslim world, eunuchs continued to be used not only to manage harems, but also to guard Muhammad's tomb up until the 20th century. But there are no more court eunuchs anywhere in the world today. So when did Castrati get started? That was, I don't know what got started, but that was more associated with 19th century. So those, of course, being the famous Italian operetta singer type, yeah, high voice kind of soprano. How you can be a male soprano. Yeah. Answer, exactly. suppress secondary sexual characteristics. Exactly. Right. The last one of which died in 1922. Okay. Yeah. Also, speaking of other recent eunuch phenomena, no longer court eunuchs, but just eunuchs, in Russia in the 19th century, there was the religious sect called the Skopsi, where they perceived it as a holy act or a virtuous act to become, what do I want to say, androgynous? Yeah, so androgynous. men would, I think, cut off everything, not just the balls, right? And women so. would often cut off their breasts. I believe so, yes. Ouch. Yeah. There are yep. photographs on the internet. They're yes, not I'm, I'm fairly sure there are. Yeah. I'm, 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 there's a lot of photos on the internet you don't need to look at. Yeah. And also in India today, there's actually a group of religious devotees, which is this cult is thousands of years old. It's called the Hedra, some of which, not all of which, but some of which are castrated. And some of them are actually currently finding roles in politics. And it's very interesting why that is. We won't go into it, but there's a little... I was under the impression the Hedra were also just either people who are sort of agender or non-binary or sort of what might be considered trans again There's, i know that's difficult because we're imposing two different sort of cultural standards yeah yeah, yeah. no they 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 kind of fit into a number of different yeah. categories that we would make it's very interesting just well so. it's it's not just also not wanting to i wasn't i mean mostly actually castrated though some of them wow voluntarily or as a... voluntarily is my oh. understanding wow yeah interesting Anyway, of course, also accidents can make for a eunuch, and in my case, a snip snip. <laughs> so, but you're one of those untrustworthy pervy kinds because yeah. I can see your beard right here. Yeah. So, exactly. there's a bearded man in charge of this podcast. What's wrong with him? Yeah. And also, like we said, like I said, there are people out there who are loud and proud about being eunuchs and identify as that. So, well, that's it for our episode today. Thank you for being on the show, Anna and Nick. Thank you. <laughs> half-hearted thank you <laughs> I, I would say it's a pleasure but I don't have those urges anymore so nice. well that's all we've got for you today folks if you want to hear more about Byzantine court eunuchs check out the rest of the series on Dead Ideas 
If you've enjoyed this show and want to express your support, you can do so by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in a time period and culture of your choosing. The portraits will continue, by the way, even though the show is ending. And all patrons get access to the full backlog of episodes ad-free for both my shows, Dead Ideas and The History of Sex. So if you're thinking of becoming a patron, you will gain those perks, the backlog as well as portrait. If you are a current patron, you are welcome to discontinue. No hard feelings. In fact, that's what I expect that most people will do. Uh, I appreciate that you've been with me as long as you have. So thank you so much for your support. Or if you're a current patron and you choose to continue, well, you will continue to get access to the backlog of ad-free episodes and you will earn a new portrait each 12 months that you stay on. So it's entirely up to you. It's also possible to do a custom pledge, by the way. You could toss me a year's worth of $5 pledges all at one time and then discontinue, and I will honor that with a portrait as well. So whatever works best for you is cool with me. I'm just so happy that you have chosen to support me. And also, I really just love doing the portraits, so send them my way. I love it. I will draw you as a white-robed, pearl-necklaced eunuch surrounding the emperor like an angel around God or whatever you want. I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash b-t-n-e-w-b-e-r-g. All right, folks, I'll see you next time. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.